Father, would that be the state of our heart as we hear your word? We ask that you give us the ability to trust you with all our heart and not lean on our own understanding. Allow us as we hear your word to obey your word and to be inclined to obey your word in every aspect of our lives. Father, we dedicate ourselves to you and to your word and I ask that you allow me to step aside and to allow the Holy Spirit to minister and to meet us at our very, very point of need. We thank you for the week that we have had, the relationship week. We thank you for all the speakers and the word of God that has come out so clearly. We ask that, Lord, in your own way, you glorify yourself through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. Good morning. Okay, good morning again. Uh, why don't you help me say a quick hello to your neighbor on my behalf in a way, please, please, in a way that is creative, a way they've never seen before, okay? So come up with a way and greet them in a way that is creative. They've never seen it before. Uh, please say hi to them. Please say good morning to them. Um, and why don't you appreciate um, each and every one of them? Let me begin by saying it's been a wonderful week uh, for my wife and I um, to be among you here at UCU and to enjoy uh, the blessed time with students, with faculty, with the community. It's just been exciting. And many times you think um, that it's the person that has come to share the word of God, but it's truly the person that has come to gain most because I am more blessed as the one that has given. I have received so much in return. And I just want to thank each of you for your friendship, um, just for engaging with us, for loving us, for caring uh, for us. We truly want to celebrate each and every one of you. But allow me to specifically single out your chaplaincy. Um, this chaplaincy is an amazing, amazing chaplaincy. Why don't you give a big round of applause uh, to your chaplaincy? They are now our friends. And we have told them, because we have a home in Uganda, they have a home in Kenya, all right? And because they represent you, you also have a home in Kenya. Because you're connected to them, just tell us. You have a home in Kenya, and we celebrate the friendship and the relationship that we have formed with UCU. This is the second time that we're here, and we thank God for, you know, just the relationship that has grown over that time. Thank you also, because the last time I came, I shared with us about our leadership development program at Nairobi Chapel, and uh, you sent us two young people that had completed their studies to be part of what we call Kinara, our leadership development program. And we celebrate an amazing year uh, with both of them as they grew through their leadership journey. Our leadership journey is based on the desire to develop somebody's ability to lead themselves, their ability to lead others, and their ability to lead leaders. So over one year, they are in a multicultural community. We have interns uh, from, the, from Europe, we have interns from Asia, we have interns from the US, from Africa, from Australia, we've had interns from New Zealand, all of them gather together for one year. We have three intakes in a year, and we target students that have completed university that want to give God one year. They want to give God one year and tell God, would you teach me, would you grow me in my leadership journey? so that they grow and learn together. In those three intakes, uh, we usually take about 70 interns a year, and after that, release them to God's purposes uh, for their lives. And I just want to celebrate the relationship we've now developed with UCU. We've taken two students already, and the door is still open. If you desire to be part of this leadership journey, uh, we're coordinating with, with the chaplaincy office. You're welcome to register your intentions, and the chaplaincy office will do the vetting and will release to us the students that they would like uh, to be part of this leadership journey. So you're more than welcome to be part of this. And I'm saying this because uh, one of the coordinators of the program has come to be with us this weekend. Kate Okwe is right here. She had been introduced, but just why don't you stand up so that if anyone has a question about Kinara, uh, they can ask her. Uh, thank you very much, Kate, uh, for being part of that. Thank you again. Uh, the chaplaincy has asked me uh, this morning uh, during our service to speak on the topic wise living and that's the topic I'll be speaking on wise living wise living and at the end of our relationships week I think it's a very appropriate topic uh, to be able to kind of put the icing on the cake and to conclude everything that we have said uh, this week 
uh, by talking about what wise living is all about. Okay, So that's what we'll be addressing in the next few minutes, um, wise living. But just before we get into the text that had been read uh, to us earlier on from the, book, from the book of Proverbs, I'd like to ask you the question, what is your favorite animal? Okay? What is your favorite animal? Okay, just think about it for a minute. Your favorite animal. Okay? Or creature. If you want to call it creature. Okay? Your favorite animal. Please turn to your neighbor and tell them what your favorite animal is. Okay? Please tell them what your favorite. And tell them why. Okay? Why is it your favorite animal? Your favorite animal. Now, I know there are some of us that like animals. There are some of us that don't like animals, okay? How many of us don't like animals? Genuinely, you don't like animals. How many of us like animals? Okay, it's interesting. At least there are more of us that like animals. What do you think is the wisest animal? The wisest. What do you think is the wisest animal or creature? Because all of us have different creatures in mind, but which do you think is the wisest? Not the one that is your favorite, but according to you, which is your wisest? Okay? That's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we read from the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, from verse 24 to verse 28. And the scriptures that we've read mention four animals. They mention four animals. And the context of this scripture is that the the, the, the wise man that wrote the Proverbs says that there are four animals that are small, but they are extremely wise. They are extremely wise. And we're going to look at each of these animals because each of these animals communicate to us a principle for living wisely. They communicate to us a principle for living wisely in relationships, living wisely as a student in a university such as this, living wisely as a father, as a mother, as a husband, as a wife, living wisely as someone in business, someone who's employed. It guides us to understand what wise living is all about. Let me look at each of these animals one at a time and just share with us what I sense in my heart is the principle that God wants to teach us this morning about what living wisely is all about. And the first animal that is mentioned is the ant, the ant. The Bible says ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. That's verse 25. Of the book of Proverbs. Now, the principle that we learn from the ant, where wise living is concerned, is the principle of preparation. The principle of preparation. The principle of preparation. You see, an interesting thing is this. An ant works today for tomorrow. An ant understands the purpose of today where tomorrow is concerned. It knows what time it is now, and it knows how significant now is for tomorrow. An ant understands the value of today. For many of us, we need to realize the only time we have is the few moments you have right now. How well you maximize now. How well you invest now. How wisely and the choices that you make now will determine where you will be tomorrow, will determine what you will have tomorrow, will determine who you will be tomorrow. And I can't think of an animal that understands and recognizes this better than an ant. An ant maximizes now knowing that what I do now will determine whether I survive tomorrow or the week after. There are many of us that live what many people call a one-dimensional life. A one-dimensional life is a life that focuses on the moment, on the past or the future, in exclusion of one another. Let me just give you an example. Someone that focuses on the past, someone that focuses on the past and the past only, focuses on past successes or past failures. 
and chooses to live today in light of the past. Someone that focuses on past successes would come to UCU as a new student. And maybe in the school where they came from, they were the top of the class. And they think because they were the top of the class in the previous school where they were, they will become the top of the class here. How many have ever received those surprises? Where you realize I was only the top there. And because you're living in your past successes, you have come to a new environment that needs you to consider what you need to do today to ensure that what you succeeded in the past can continue on in the future. But there are people that come and sleep and think because I am successful, I was successful in the school before, I'm going to be successful now. I was successful in my business then, I'm going to be successful in my business now. Your past success can be the very thing that denies you your future success. The same thing with your past failure. The people, yes, failure is normal. Everybody here has failed, regardless who you are. But there are many people who have failed in their past and they allow their, their past failure to move them from saying, I have failed, to saying, I am a failure. They make their past failure become their identity in the present and deny them the opportunity of becoming successful in this second attempt, becoming successful in this new opportunity that God has given them. There are people who live in the future, not in the past, not in the present, but in the future. And by future, I mean, do you know those people who procrastinate? I'm going to do that tomorrow, not today. I'm going to do it when? Tomorrow. There are many people who some people call, they are called coming soon. They've never arrived. They're coming soon. You're always waiting for what they said they're going to do for them to actually do it. They live in the future. And they don't recognize there is an action I need to do now. So that my intentions for the future ha actually happen. There are some people who live in the present. Not in the past, not in the future, but they live in the present. And it happens a lot to us as young people. Especially in the context that we're in right now in a university. Where you get overtaken by the privilege of the freedom that you have as a student now in a university such as this. You have the freedom to walk into a class or not. You have the freedom to attend classes or not. You have the freedom to do whatever you want to do. You are at a place in your life where you're making decisions for yourself. And many of us get swamped by this freedom and overtaken by this privilege that we forget that with every privilege comes responsibilities. Comes responsibilities. So many students make the choice not to enjoy their life but to completely over enjoy and waste away their life today. It's good to enjoy today. Okay? But it's not good for you to be obsessed with enjoying today that you lose sight of the responsibilities that God has given you today. There are people that live in the present without any, any foresight for tomorrow. Without any any consciousness of their responsibilities where tomorrow is concerned and not connecting their actions today with the outcome of their lives tomorrow. The aunt is speaking to us if we're any of these people. Either living in the past, living in the present, or living in the future. Because the aunt knows what time it is now. And it knows that because this is the only time I have, it is the opportunity to prepare myself for what is coming or for where I am going. The ant, the Bible says, works when it is summer. Summer simply means when the conditions are ideal, when everything is favorable, when you have all that you need. It works in the summer. When the opportunity is ripe for you to do what you can do, the summer is the, is, is the season that the ant works. I suggest to us that the summer could be the time in your life when your wallet is full. Okay? For many students, that's rare and, and far between. Eh? Uh, because you're struggling financially through your journey as a student. But when the wallet is full, when you have some income, when you have some money, it is the right time to save 
or to invest. But for many of us, we celebrate that time. When I was in university, in Kenyatta University, we used to have boom. The government used to give us money to, you know, to be in university because it was a privilege to be in university. So we used to be given money so that we could be able to study. I kid you not, we did. I mean, the minute students got money, we all went into town and bought the biggest stereo or music system that you could ever buy to make sure that your room is the loudest room in the halls and your friends gather in your room because your room has the best music. We wasted away the money that we would have invested into our future. We thought about music now and the experience and the encounter now. My wallet was full then. But many of us found ourselves immediately after university without an income, dry. You can't even get the next meal. And yet you've wasted away what you had. The summer. The summer is a favorable time. When my body is healthy, what God, what does God want me to do when my body is strong and healthy? When my studies are thriving, when my fees has been paid. There may be seasons where I need to struggle because my fees may not be paid. When my friends are plenty, when my job is fulfilling, when the economy is thriving, when the weather is good, prepare then. That's the right time to be able to invest correctly as the ant does. The reality of life is life has different seasons. After the summer comes the winter. The winter is the season in life where things have fallen. The leaves have fallen. It's not as beautiful and glamorous as the other seasons. It's the season that is cold. And sometimes the season that is harsh. In many nations that experience winter, it is in winter that most of those people in those nations get depressed. Depression is in, in an all-time high during the winter seasons because it's gloomy. Sometimes even the sun is out half the time. It's usually out the rest of the year. Those seasons come in life. Those difficult and trying seasons. Somebody tried to put it this way. That all of us, regardless of who we are, are going to be at any point in our life in any of these three stages. Either you're getting into a trial, you are in a trial, or you're getting out of a trial. At any point in life, you're guaranteed to be in one of those. If things are going on well right now, guess what? You're getting into a trial because that is life. I'm sorry for the bad news, but that is life. If you are presently in a trial and you're thinking it cannot get worse, guess what? Life has it that you're just about to get out. That's the good news. Regardless who we are, the nature of life is lived out in seasons. The ant knows that. The ant knows that during the summer I should develop a social support network around me so that when I need people to stand with me I have them because I built good relationships at the right time. And this is an excellent season in a university setting such as this to develop friends that will walk with you literally throughout all the seasons of life. This is not the time for you to be alone. This is not the time for you not to open up your heart and your life to the people that God has blessed you to be around you. This is the time to develop meaningful relationships, meaningful friendships, meaningful networks that will catapult you forward in life and be able to assist you and walk with you through all the seasons of life. This is your summer where God has gathered hundreds of people around you after you finish in this university, ask anyone who has finished, you go back to your home. And this amazing community is no longer there. And many people, many people struggle with loneliness because they're used to having people around them. This is your summer. What are you doing with your summer? Are you investing in meaningful relationships? Are you investing in people's lives? Are you doing for people what later on you'd expect for them to do for you. When one of the students is needy, one of the biggest things I saw in university is a student who is needy and you find 10 students around them saying we're going to help you with your school fees because I have extra. That ministers so greatly to someone in need and later on when you are in need yourself, you'll have a community around you. I don't know what season you're in, 
But the point that the aunt is teaching us is winter is part of life. Broken hearts, broken dreams, broken lives, broken homes. The question is, are you ready for it? Have you stored what it takes to weather the winter? Have you stored up the word of God to be able to carry you through the storms of life? Is Jesus in your boat to be able to still and to quiet the storms of life when you go through difficulties? Have you wasted the summer? Have you wasted the opportunities that God has given you to store up in preparation for the winter? You'll always take into the winter the provisions that you have stored up in the summer. You will always take into the winter the provisions that you have stored up in the summer. The question the aunt is asking us is, are you ready for that? The second animal is the coney. Or in some versions, the Bible calls it the hyrax, verse 26. In some of your Bibles, it's written hyrax. Uh, in some of uh, your Bibles, it's written coney. In some of your Bibles, it's written the rock badger, the rock badger. Verse 26 gives us the image of the hyrax. Allow me to use the word hyrax. The principle, could you help me? What was the first principle? The principle of preparation. The second principle is the principle of protection. Protection. The principle of protection. And it comes from the life or the lifestyle of this rock badger. If you don't know what a rock badger is or a corn is, it's like a squirrel. It's a small animal that lives among, the Bible says in verse 26, it lives among the crags. The crags is the rocks. Every rock badger has a pile of rocks, a rock pile that it calls its home. That's where it calls it its home. Okay? That's it, the place, its place of safety, security, of nurture. This is what I discovered about the hyrax or the rock badger. I gather that a rock badger will never go more than 20, mile, 20 um, meters away from the rock pile that it was born. Throughout its life, it will never go further than 20 meters of the rock pile that it was born. Now, I don't know if you get this, but imagine not being able to go more than 20 meters from where you were born for the rest of your life. You can't go more than 20 meters. There's a reason. The reason why a hyrax does, would never stray more than 20 meters of where it was born or where it considers its rock pile is it knows that at any point there are predators like huge eagles and hawks that are after it or foxes that are going around in the rocks looking for it or wild dogs that are looking for it, it knows regardless which predator comes, if I am 20 meters radius of the rock pile that I call home, I can make it into the rock before the hawk gets me. I can make it into the rock before the fox gets me. It knows that I can make it. I can run and I can hide. I will not get caught. If I am within 20 miles, 20 meters, sorry. Now it's important to understand because this is the principle of boundaries. The principle of boundaries. It's important to draw a radius around your life and say these are the limits that I'm going to live within. This is my safety limit. This is my boundary. What the Proverbs is telling us is a foolish life is a boundaryless life. A wise life is a life that has drawn boundaries. The badger knows I can run and hide in my rock of safety when predators or when danger comes. Now, I come from the part of Kenya, the Rift Valley. It's a part of Kenya that produces the most famous athletes. Uh, and I'm not bragging, but I'm just saying that we have made Africa proud. Amen? We have made Africa proud. Where I come from, we have made this continent proud. Eh? Uh, we know what running is. Okay? We know what athletics is. Eh? We can run not just far, but fast. 
Okay? Um, so if you want to try me after this, we can try it outside in the field. Eh? Guys, running into the rock pile. Let me just stretch this illustration a bit more. For the rock badger, its place of safety and security is the rock pile. For I, a believer, my place of safety and security is my rock, Jesus Christ. I need to be close enough to Jesus and never stray away from the boundaries that Jesus has given as the boundaries to my safety and to my security. There's a second thing about the rock badger. You'll notice if you look at a rock badger, the color of the rock badger is very close to the color of the rocks. It's camouflage. It's grayish brown. Depending on the rock pile that it is, it actually has, uh, uh, you know, its it, it, it skin is of the same or close to the same color as the rocks. It's a way that they are able to blend into their habitation. I'm going to suggest to us, as I stretch this illustration a bit more, it's not about just the closeness to Christ, but it's about the likeness to Christ that matters. For us to live wise, we don't just need to be close to Christ, we need to be like Christ, of Christ-like character, of Christ-like nature. That becomes our place of safety. That becomes our place of security. That becomes our place of protection and thriving as a believer, as the lesson that we have learned from the rock badger. It's not just where you're located. It's not just how far you are from Christ. It's how much of Christ do you look like. The third one is the locust. The third animal is the locust. The image of the locust. And the principle that we learn here is the principle of procession. Procession. The principle of procession. Who do you go with in life? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because we spent a lot of time during the week talking about the company that you keep as an individual can make you or break you, can form you or destroy you. This is the lesson from the locust. Let me explain it in two ways. The first way is the locust, the locust cannot destroy on its own. A locust is only destructive or you can only see the impact of a locust when it is in the context of a swarm, when it is in the context of a community of locusts. And I suggest to us the wisest way to live is not to live alone. The wisest way to live is to live in a community, a procession, a group of people that will be able to make huge and great impact in this world. At the Nairobi Chapel, we tried to describe what a disciple of Jesus Christ looks like. And we've taken a long time to try and define what a disciple of Christ looks like. At the end of the day, we've come back to a simple image of what a disciple of Christ looks like. And the image we use at the chapel is the big five, in line with the big five animals that are found here in Africa. What are the big five animals? The lion, the elephant, the rhino, the leopard, and the buffalo. Those are the big five animals. And all we've done is we've compared an animal and the characteristic of an animal to what Christ would like to have in our lives as a disciple. The lion, at the chapel we call the lion the word of God. Because the lion is the king of the jungle. We all need to submit to the word of God. All the animals in the food chain submit to the lion. The lion is on top of the food chain. So for us, we choose to submit our entire lives to the word of God as the lion. The second is the elephant. The elephant is the animal that covers the longest distances. The animal that can walk the furthest. And the elephant symbolizes witnessing or evangelism. And our encouragement to anyone that is a growing disciple of Christ is to go as far and wide to spread the good news of the gospel as my responsibility as a disciple of Jesus Christ. 
And we say go as far, not just physically, but within your networks, relationally. Go as far and wide and introduce as many people to Christ. The third animal is the leopard. The leopard is the animal that hides away in secret. If you go for a safari, it's very rare that you'll see a leopard. It's not obvious because it hides away in secret. And there's a value of a Christian hiding away in secret and connecting with God through prayer. The leopard represents prayer. Those intimate moments, those quiet moments that you need to spend with God as a believer to grow as a believer and to be nourished. The next one is the rhino. The rhino is the animal that charges out. It's the animal that most probably is able to attack you. And God wants us to charge out with our gifts, our talents. Charging out or the rhino is service. He wants us to serve God with our talent of music, to serve God with our talent of hospitality like the wardens, to serve God, to charge out if you are a disciple. But the one I wanted to focus on was the fifth one. The fifth animal is the buffalo. The buffalo is the animal that always operates in herds. You will never see a buffalo on its own if it's normal. If you find a buffalo on its own, it's dangerous. There's something wrong with it. And God is telling us there's something wrong with me as a Christian if I live my Christian life on my own. I am dangerous if I live my Christian life on my own because I've been designed by God to live my Christian life in the context of community, in the context of a herd. It's only in the context of a herd that you can see the impact of my life as a Christian, that you bring out the best in me. The best in a locust is brought out in a swarm, is brought out when the locust is among other locusts that are ready, focused to accomplish one thing. You, the impact of your life will be seen if you do not live it alone, but if you surround yourself with like-minded people that are willing to help you make a huge and a great impact in your life. Your procession matters. Do not walk alone. Do not walk alone. The last animal is the lizard. And this is where I'll close our sermon. The lizard. The image of the lizard is what I call the image of pardon. And I'll explain. Pardon. The image of pardon. Or the lesson of pardon. The life and wise lesson of pardon. The lizard the Bible says it's such a small animal, it can actually be caught with your hand. But somehow such an animal that can be caught with somebody's hand and there's nothing glamorous about it can be found in king's palaces. You see, the lizard is so defenseless. It doesn't have any poison. The lizard cannot fend off any predator. It has no way of defending itself. And that's why it can be easily caught with your hand. The lizard has no protective qualities. In fact, the lizard has no glamour. It has nothing. There's nothing special. Even it looks bad. I mean, there's nothing special about the lizard. It's a lizard. There's nothing special about it. But yet, even though there's nothing special about it, it can be found in king's palaces. It has access to the king's palace. A helpless creature has access to the presence of the king. And that reminds me of me. A helpless creature. A human being that is fallen. A human being that is sinful. A human being that has made so many mistakes. A human being that sometimes cannot even defend myself against sin. A human being like me. The Bible says in Hebrews, I can approach his throne of grace with confidence and find help in times of need. A human being like me, God has opened up the doors of his palace and has told me, you have access. You can come just the way you are. You can come to my presence. There's nothing glamorous about you. In fact, you're so helpless and hopeless, but you can have access the lesson of the lizard where I am concerned is a lesson of grace. It doesn't merit to be in the king's palace, but it gets there if it wants to. If it wants to access the presence of the king, it will. 
And the context of that passage of scripture in Hebrews that talks about us having confidence to approach his throne, the context is where the scriptures say Jesus was tempted in every way. We face temptations as Jesus did in every way. We make mistakes. We mess up. There's nothing glamorous about our lives, but guess what? In spite of that, the king says, you're entitled to my presence just the way you are. Unlikely people can be found in the king's presence because we have a God of grace. There's a time I asked my wife to do something because in our cultures, you know, when, when a man dies, you know, the family comes and there's a lot of arguments around it. So I, I told my wife what I want to be written on my tombstone when I die so that my family does not tell her what to write. I already have told her what to write on my tombstone. I don't want my name there. I don't want the day I, I was born. I don't want the day I died. There are only four words that I want to be written where I'm buried. And this is just a reminder. Uh, just a reminder. Uh, <laughs> there are only four words. And the four words I'd like to be written on my tombstone is forgiven, faithful, fruitful, finisher. Forgiven, faithful, fruitful, finisher. And I remember telling her, in that order. Because the first thing I want my life to symbolize is the life of a man who knows he's forgiven by a gracious God. He is forgiven, but he doesn't, does not deserve to be alive. He does not deserve to be where he is today. It is by God's grace that I am doing what I'm doing and I'm where I am. I never want to forget it. I want people to remember it even when I die. You see, I was told a story of a man who was sailing the high seas. And unfortunately, this man's boat got, he got shipwrecked. So his boat got messed up and he got, um, you know, he found himself on a deserted island. Um, he drifted away and finally found himself on a deserted island with a few possessions that he had held on to. When he was on that deserted island, the man felt hopeless because there was sea all around. There was no chance of survival at all. So he tried to scream and to shout and do everything that he can to catch somebody's attention, but he was in the middle of nowhere. So he resigned himself to his fate and he decided, let me build a hut, a small hut. Let me put all my possessions into the hut and let me walk around and look for any food in this island and see how long I can live. So he built a hut, a small hut. He put all his possessions inside and then after he had finished that, he went around the island looking for food. So he went sourcing for food. Finally, he found enough food and as he was walking back to his hut with the stock of food that he had gathered, he saw his hut on fire. It was burning. It was in flames. Because of the heat in the island, there was a spontaneous fire, and it, it, it resulted in his heart burning. All his worldly possessions that he had salvaged from the shipwreck were inside that heart. And this man walked with the food next to the heart. He threw the food down. He looked up at God. He was angry. He was mad at God. And he expressed his anger, his, disappointment, his disappointment, and his, his, his just his he, he, he doesn't want anything to do with God. And in expressing that, he expressed that for so long and he used all his strength to be able to do it until he collapsed and he fainted right next to the hut. So he fainted and while he was resting, after some time, he was startled. He was startled or he was woken up by some loud noise. And when he woke up, he saw a big ship right next to the island. And when he saw the ship, he woke up and he was excited that he would not die. He ran into the ship and he immediately walked up to the captain and he had one question for the captain. He asked the captain, how did you know I was on this island? Just explain to me, how did you know? This is what the captain told him. I saw the smoke signal. That's what the captain told him. The house that had burnt down became the signal for his help and became the signal that the ship saw so that it could come to this island to rescue him. Allow me to suggest to you that regardless the state of your relationship, your relationship may look like it's burning down right now. But let me suggest to you it's just a smoke signal for God to come to your rescue. For God to come to your rescue. 
It doesn't matter where your studies are. You may just be about to give up on your studies. You're frustrated because it doesn't look like anything is working. Guess what? That's just a smoke signal. Maybe it's your marriage and you're about to give up on your marriage. You're about to give up on your children. You're about to give up on whatever it is that is burning in your life right now. Guess what? It's just a smoke signal. Because guys, I guarantee you, we serve a God of second chances. We serve a God of grace. And regardless how bad your situation seems, your situation is never too bad for a resurrection. Not if you have the resurrection and the life himself in your life. God is able to come through for you. And I thank God because today we're going to be sharing in Holy Communion. And I just want to encourage us as we share in Holy Communion today. Holy Communion is the ultimate symbol of pardon. It's the ultimate symbol of a God that came to a world that had already denied him. Because of his great love for an undeserving world, he gave his life for you and for me. Why don't you place whatever it is, as we take Holy Communion, place whatever it is that needs pardon in the presence of God and let God deal with it. Let God deal with your relationship. Let God deal with your family. Let God deal with your situation. But don't forget the lessons we've learned today for wisdom. The lesson of preparation. Are you prepared for your future? Are you prepared for both the good, the bad, and the ugly? Are you storing up what you need to be able to make it the distance in the journey and in the purposes that God has in store for your life? Are you protected? And by protection, I simply mean, do you have boundaries? Do you have principles? Do you have limits in your life that guard you from the dangers that are in this world? How is your procession? Are you alone or do you have the necessary people around you so that your life can make a huge impact? Not just a small impact, but a huge impact as locusts do. What is your life procession like? And finally, we serve a God of pardon. Have you received his pardon? Have you received his grace? Have you given yourself a second chance so that you can make right what God desires for you to make right? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. And as we continue to respond to your word through prayer and intercession, and later on as we respond to your word through the receiving of the elements of the Holy Communion as a symbol of your great pardon and grace, would you allow us to respond to you appropriately? Thank you for the lessons you've taught us on wise living. May each of us live wise in accordance to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.